Thank you. So, so um, I was brought up in a very small cottage, in the middle of nowhere in Wales. It was completely off grid. Um, we had no telephone, no electric, and we even had to walk for two miles every morning to go and collect the post. Um, but at the age of seven years old, I started playing Akora. And the reason why I started playing is because my father started playing. And the reason he started playing is because my mother bought him a ticket to go and see a concert in London, and it turned out to be two quarter players. And he fell in love with the music and tried to go home and play it on the guitar and found out it was really difficult. Tried to make one, I think. And then eventually got hold of one and eventually ended up going to West Africa to study from a guy. And then when he came back, he started teaching me and my three siblings. Um, and that's how I started playing. So I started playing quite a lot and I would play two hours a day, every single day. Um, and then when I was a little bit older, I found a cassette of a, another chorus player called Tumani Jobati, who's a very famous, influential chorus player from Mali. And I became obsessed with the way he played, because it's very different from the way that I played. So I'd spend hours sort of winding back and forth the, the cassette and listening to little bits and trying to work out the notes uh, into the night sometimes, early hours in the morning. I didn't realize at the time you're not supposed to play the chorus at nighttime by yourself. But I'll get back to that in a minute. <laughs> Um, so the kora is part of a very, very old, very rich tradition, Jalia. The Jalis are the ones that play the kora, and they also do many other things. They have many, many important roles in society. Uh, they're historians, and they're poets, and they're storytellers, and they're um, praise singers, and they play many different instruments, and this is one of the instruments they play. Um, so when I was about 15 years old, this guy, Tamani, that I had been listening to, he um, was playing in the Barbican in London, and obviously the whole family wanted to go and see. We'd, we'd all been playing the chorus. Uh, we didn't have a lot of money at the time. So my mother actually phoned up the Barbican and uh, spoke to someone there. And they managed to put in contact with someone. They actually ended up giving us free tickets, the whole family, okay. which was lovely. So went there. After the concert, me and my brother went to go and perform for him to money backstage. And obviously he was quite surprised to see uh, two young teenagers from Wales playing this instrument that you know is part of his very old tradition. So he invited us to go and study with him. Um, it wasn't for till some years later, a few years later, uh, that we had the money together to go on this trip to West Africa. So I went on this journey to go and study from the great master. Um, and I remember la landing into, into West Africa for the first time, not really having left Wales before very much. Uh, not speaking any of the local languages, um, and a very little bit of French, which is the other language they speak there. So it felt a bit alien to me, as you can imagine. But when I eventually arrived into a compound and someone handed me the Cora, all of a sudden these people I could communicate with everyone. And uh, we had this weird understanding and weird understanding of this music that I'd been learning in this cottage in Wales. I could suddenly communicate with these complete strangers that I couldn't even talk to. So much so there was... Uh, a young guy there who was also learning Kora from, from that part of the world, who's from a small village. Um, and we spent weeks together playing from morning to night, morning to night, you know, really close. And uh, Tamani, the guy who was teaching me, came up to me afterwards and said, how are you guys communicating? And I said, well, I do speak a little bit of French. And he said, he doesn't speak any French. So <laughs> I don't know how you guys have been talking. <laughs> We've just been talking at each other, not realizing we're speaking a different language. But we've become really close through this really old music, which I thought was really amazing. Um, and this music is very complex, and I was only just starting to sort of delve into this by this point. I was waiting up until three o'clock in the morning for Tomani to come back, because he was a very influential, famous guy, he's had lots of busy stuff to do. And he, he is a 70th generation choral player, so it's told. And it's passed on from father to son, father to son, father to son. Um, and that's when I started to realize this, this instrument and this music and this, this oral tradition is actually really, really complex and incredible. I remember when I was much younger, back in, in Wales, I was at a music festival, and I'd met some other musicians from that part of the world, from Jarley's, and we'd been jang hanging out and playing and stuff. And uh, afterwards, I went back to my tent, and I was going to play the chorus, as I often did, until into the early hours of the morning. And I hadn't realized at the time, but they heard me playing, and they'd come and sat outside my tent. Because one of the rules of the kora is one of the one of the instruments, especially the kora, is that you don't play it at night by yourself because the spirits come and listen and they can corrupt your soul. And I didn't know they'd been sitting outside the whole night with me until like <laughs> six o'clock in the morning. So, um, 
Uh, but one young guy told me not so long ago, who was also a Jali, he told me that if, uh, if you didn't fear the spirits and you, uh, you listened to them, they had things to tell you, to teach you, which is nice. And I like to believe that because I played so much by myself at night. So. <laughs> <laughs> I like to think my soul isn't corrupted. Some of these pieces of music that are played on this instrument and other instruments and some of the stories that are told, some of the history that's kept alive is through this completely oral tradition. Some, some of the pieces go back to the time before Sunjata Kato, who's the uh, king of the Malayan Empire, which is over 700 years ago. And they're still sung today, and they're still played today, and they're still played by the youth as well of this part of the world, and it's in the pop music. And it's still very important, and it's still very current. And I think the reason why it's so current and why it's still so alive is because it hasn't been written down. Because it gives it the ability to, sh to sh shift with the different sort of uh, fashions of the time. And each generation turns it into what they want it to be, keeps it alive, but they can sort of change it to something that they think is cool. <coughs> basically. Um, and I'm going off in a completely different direction with this instrument because I'm doing my own thing. I'm not really apart from that tradition. I'm just using the instrument. Um, so I'm going to perform for you another piece now. It's called Nine, which is what my grandmother was called. She was Welsh. Um, it's just a piece I composed for her. Um, I hope you enjoy. Thank you. 